welcome everyone to the deep dive session on investment facilitation and key focus areas from investment conducted by the board of investment of sri lanka the session will be moderated by savitri rodrigo and will feature the chairman and director general of the board of investment Sri Lanka's biggest advantages in being located in this region is its strategic geographic location. But to become a competitive investment destination, is that enough? There has to be more. Add access to emerging and established markets with good logistics networks, highly competent skills, multiple resource pools and a very livable country given that we have a little bit of paradise thrown in. Sri Lanka is up there among the best investor destinations. In this session however we move to the thrust the heart of what is needed in investment. How does Sri Lanka facilitate investment? Where has Sri Lanka got an edge and what key focus areas hold promise? As was mentioned with me today is the chairman of the board of investment of Sri Lanka Sanjay Mohotala and director general Pasan Vanika Sekar. Welcome gentlemen. Chairman, Sri Lanka has positioned itself as Asia's next growth haven and the BOI has adopted a multi-pronged approach for yeah. investor outreach based on sector strategy and specific value. What are the thrust sectors you are looking at? Yes, Avitri, I think uh, Sri Lanka as a country uh, even during adverse times have recorded a uh, good growth rate. Um, if you look at the last decade even with the couple of years of uh, adversity we see during covid uh, we have uh, got about 5% of gdp growth and we are a country around uh, $4000 per gdp per capita which i would say a country at an inflection point with the right policy orchestration and the thrusts that is when typically countries take over take over so in line with uh, what was outlined uh, in uh, His Excellency the President Gotabe Rajapaksha's manifesto, uh, we have put the foundation to take this country to double its GDP over in this decade, and also to get to about $30 billion worth of uh, in, uh, export receipts and service receipts by 2025. Now, to do this, you need a holistic orchestration of the economy. Now, we need to think about how do you build on existing strengths, but also think about what is or what kind of economy do we need to inherit in another five to 10 years and put the foundations to get there. So if you look at um, uh, this particular framework that I presented in my plenary, uh, there are six thrust sectors that we look at. Now, inherently, uh, Sri Lanka is strong in manufacturing. Uh, BOI companies, uh, numbering about 1,200 foreign companies, account for about 85% of all the industrial exports. Uh, we are very well known for our tea, rubber, coconut, and uh, eye apparels. But here's where we need to put the foundation to build a few more billion dollar verticals in the next years to come. So we have chosen pharmaceuticals, apparel, and electronics being uh, three of such verticals we want to focus on in manufacturing. You may ask why. Uh, pharmaceutical again, like, uh, well, we would like to internalize some of the pharmaceutical manufacturing in the country. We have the know-how. We have so many companies already producing uh, pharmaceutical products in Sri Lanka. Geo uh, geopolitically neutral destination um, compared to some of the things that we have seen with some of our uh, uh, companies in, in the region who had gone through uh, many trials and tribulations during COVID. Sri Lanka is an open destination in terms of uh, ensuring supply chain resilience. The second most important thing on a farmer point of view it is that uh, we have a very strong Ayurveda or indigenous medicine, if you call it, right? Just like what TCM has been for China, Sri Lanka can take advantage of it. So this is about planting that seed to really holistically think about developing the pharma sector, not just to be a billion dollar, but with the nutraceuticals coming in, with the, the, the wellness trends you see in the world, this is putting the foundation to build a multi-billion dollar vertical. Uh, and this will also rub in very well with our agriculture, right? Most of these has to be planted, harvested. Also with our tourism sector in terms of wellness point of view. So you see how the linkages happen in an economy. The second part of it is apparel, like uh, uh, $5 billion plus worth of exports. We are known to be the most ethical sourcing destination in the world in terms of labor practices. 
We are putting efforts to make it the most environmentally sensitive and socially responsible sourcing destination. Here's an, here's an opportunity for us to localize some of these manufacturing in the country, but also create supply chain resilience in the process. So it, it serves both sides of it. Uh, then electronics. Well, a lot of people ask me, like, are you trying to be the next Vietnam? I would say no. But I think if you look at just about the horizon, there are a lot of new technologies coming in. Take the country as an example. Um, the manifesto says we want to be 70% uh, energy generated through renewables. So that means either solar or wind. So to solar, you need polysilica, you need to have the silicon substrates and all that. We are always talking about Industry 4.0. That means everything that we know will have some sort of a processing capacity. There's microchips you need, memory chips, circuitry, so and so forth, right? And then graphene is hailed as uh, one of the wonder material, right? Uh, if you take all these things, I think Microsoft, uh, sorry, I think Bill Gates used to say this thing that you overestimate what technology does in three years, but always underestimate the transformation it brings in 10. So if you look at graphene, it's the same, right? And there was a lot of hype about a couple of years ago, but now you see a lot of more commercial applications coming in. Sri Lanka offers the best vein graphite in the world. The purity point of view, I think, almost 100% purity. Some of the patents that we have, or Sri Lankans got, um, can extract graphene at the cheapest cost. So why not take advantage and build something that is relevant for the future, and also with the embedded technologies coming on chips and so on and so forth, we can take advantage of ICT sector as well. You see, we are looking at how the interplay between different sectors and bring that orchestration so that the whole ecosystem develops. So these are the points you call it like a, in a fabric, you lift at a point, the entire pyramid falls into place. So these are how we have chosen that. So technology is the same, ICT, like uh, I'll go in probably more in detail later on, but uh, Sri Lankan code uh, powers many critical applications, whether it is stock exchanges, boardrooms, uh, airlines, so and so forth. Um, we are dubbed the island of ingenuity. Why not double, triple it? And because um, a, a knowledge talent pool that we have can take advantage of it. Again, a neutral place in the world where many people can work, uh, cost effective location. Right? Whether it's software engineering, whether it is a BPOs, whether it is the service delivery, it's a segment that we can uh, easily double, triple with the talent pool that's coming in. Hospitality and tourism. I think this is, I mean, we were known many decades ago, I would say many hundreds of years, right? The, the, the destination of choice. Whether you, you, you are a sun, sand, or sea seeker, or whether you want cuisine or do you want to look at the 2,500 years of history that what Sri Lanka offers, uh, whether it is the next destination out of uh, outside uh, Africa in terms of wildlife. Sri Lanka offers something for everyone. And since, since 2009, we have almost grown 10x in terms of our tourism revenues. But we are far short of what a Thailand or a Malaysia offers. But if you take what Malaysia offers, everything that Malaysia offers across the vast geography, we have it in a small teardrop-shaped country with 65,000 square kilometers with three, four year, hours of drive at best. With the new highway systems coming in, we'll connect most of these locations. So doubling um, the, the tourism receipts, uh, what we received, got in 2019, post-COVID uh, post pandemic, I think is a attainable target with about 4 million um, uh, tourist arrivals. And I think the agri and food processing is the, the fourth vertical. Um, when a country doubles GDP, it's critical to make sure that the growth comes inclusive. Um, either directly or indirectly, roughly about 50, 60% of our population is uh, engaged in some sort of agri-related activity. Some of the policy changes that was orchestrated or taken recently, where our country has um, taken a considered decision by uh, His Excellency to move towards more organic produce. Uh, so this provides a, a great opportunity for anyone who looks at sourcing organic products for the health um, focused consumers, a big trend that's happening. Um, so this is a good opportunity. Beyond that, I think let's take uh, other examples like rubber. 
Uh, we are known for our rubber. I think there was the, the rice and rubber pact long ago in the 60s with China. But now I think we have become the solid tire capital of the world. See, close to about 30% of the tire demand, solid tire demands comes from Sri Lanka. With the new investments that I've seen in the last year, with companies expanding as well as new investments coming in, we'll probably have about 80% growth or not, almost doubling the vertical in, in the next um, two to three years. So we're well on path well in, uh, in terms of uh, getting a two and a half X growth in this sector. Again, fisheries is the same. We have almost about 1,900 kilometers worth of uh, coastline. We haven't really exploited the, um, the fisheries or the aquaculture potential. We do have, we have, there's BOI companies who are made in roads, but there's many uh, opportunities that uh, provides that, for example, countries like Indonesia, maybe Norway, even India has taken advantage of it. Uh, it's uh, as the people become mobile, the demand for the fish and the meats go up. So this is an opportunity again. Again, the other services sector, that's, uh, I would say, the, uh, the fourth vertical. Um, the, the, the idea of the country is to get into a knowledge-based economy. When you thrust to a knowledge-based economy, it is not just ICT. It's banking, it's insurance, it's all the other services that we can offer. So in that sense, uh, with the port city as a, a premium investment destination, an orchestration, just like what we see in Qatar investment, cent, uh, investment or financial center, or like Dubai or Singapore or Labuan, we provide a compelling investment destination. Uh, anyone who engage in the service sector to take root and cater to almost $3 billion worth of emerging medium affluent consumers, whether it is South Asia or East Africa, and cost effectively. So I think uh, anyone who's looking at uh, Dubai or Qatar and saying it's actually becoming cost, more costly. Here's a brand new destination which provides a similar level playing field, a great talent pool, and in a much more cost-effective way. The last but not least is infrastructure. As a country doubles its GDP, uh, the, the people become upward mobile. Urbanization is bound to happen. Um, and there's more need for Class A real estate, people become more mobile, uh, whether it's rapid transits, uh, whether it is the, the ports for goods, imports and exports, the roads, the airports, all these has to be developed for world, world class standard. Meaning Sri Lanka already just offer that, but it's just that we have to continue to keep on, continue to develop. So overall, I think across these three, six sectors, there's quite a bit of interplay um, and interlinkages. And that's how an economic orchestration that needs to come in. So this is just the verticals. And then it's about the, keeping the cost competitiveness, ease of doing business, getting the policies, the tax in, uh, incentives, talent pools. All this has to come in. And that's when a country takes off. So that orchestration is what is really needed. And that's what Sri Lanka offers. And only by doing so, we will, un, we will uh, usher in the growth decade and become in the growth haven. That was very comprehensive. Now, let me ask DG, um, how were these thrust sectors identified? The uh, chairman gave the entire, you know, gave the whole explanation of the thrust sectors, but how were these identified? Well, good question, Savitri, and thanks for that. Um, chairman uh, mentioned quite a few reasons behind them as well. Um, but much thought has gone into identifying, as you said, these thrust sectors, and if you, Look at the slide that was um, shown earlier. You will see the strategic enable, enablers, right? Low cost of doing business, high ease of doing business, as well as low risk of doing business are key strategic enablers in this respect. And out of those three, let me pick on the low cost of doing business. Sri Lanka offers the productivity adjusted, the lowest cost of labor. Right, Pro productivity of, uh, adjusted. Now, does that mean the lowest wages? That's not exactly the focus of especially the service industry and uh, certain industries that require specially skills. That's why we, uh, we, we look at the productivity adjusted labor cost. Um, and also Sri Lanka, the, the youth of Sri Lanka, if you look at the youth of Sri Lanka universally, Literate, almost 100% literate. 
46% are digitally savvy, 30% computer literacy. That makes a natural uh, uh, base case for ICT, right? And we are just next door to the ICT hub of the world, the back office, uh, as well as the uh, knowledge processing destination of the uh, uh, corporates of the world. And the pandemic, one thing that the pandemic has uh, taught the entire world is the need for redundancy and backup, be, uh, business continuity. And Sri Lanka offers just that, right? Uh, and and that Sri Lanka, uh, India plus story uh, gels in very well in this era where um, critical industries need continuity despite anything, right? Um, then moving on to <clears throat> another thing that this, this pandemic era has taught the entire world is the need for self-sufficiency in both food and as well as health, right? So that's one of the key reasons why uh, we've chosen pharmaceuticals. Um, and there's a ready market in Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka does import quite a bit, uh, quite, quite uh, some of its um, uh, pharmaceutical products. And we have seen success stories within the country of producing much of its uh, pharmaceutical products. But uh, we are building a dedicated pharmaceutical zone. As you know, pharmaceuticals is one industry where there's a uh, lot of complications in, in terms of uh, affluent, right? The advantage of setting up shop in this exclusive pharmaceutical zone is that, number one, pre-clearance for most of the pharmaceutical products. Uh, common affluent processing facilities are there. So the companies don't need to set up their own uh, discharge and pro treatment uh, facilities. And there is a ready market, right? Um, then moving on to uh, food, no-brainer. Um, we, we export the best tea in the world, cinnamon in the world. And there are so many other products that Sri Lanka can offer from an agriculture perspective, as well as there is a need in-house within the country as well. Not to mention rubber, as Chairman mentioned, Sri Lanka has grown to become the rubber capital, the tire capital of the world, with close to 10 global brands manufacturing uh, their products in Sri Lanka. Right. Um, then moving on to apparels, 5.5 billion exports break in to the country, apparel sector. But at the same time, at the back end, we import quite a lot of our raw materials. So there's a ready market for textiles fabric. And that's why we are building a dedicated textile and fabric zone in Arabur. So companies don't have to look for customers. There is a ready market. Again, um, uh, it, it provides um, uh, supply chain stability. Um, enables our domestic industries to increase value addition, domestic value addition, enabling them to take better advantage of uh, global uh, taxation schemes such as GSP, etc. So um, those are some of the uh, reasons behind why we've deliberately chosen these sectors. And as well as holistically the synergistic effect of, of these coming through and building a whole holistic ecosystem that will pull the whole economy and the society up, helping not just GDP growth, but also socioeconomic growth. So, Chairman, from a broad perspective, what are the policies and strategies that there are in place to make Sri Lanka an investor-friendly destination? I would say uh, a lot. And I think uh, the reason that we organize this um, investor conference is the same matter, I would say, Savitri. I would say if you take the last year, um, to start with a cohesive policy to drive the economy. Um, then secondly, I think the question is, what are the policies that you, what we have put in, right? Um, secondly, I think the important thing is the policy consistency, which we as a country has lacked in the past. I think <clears throat> with certain adversities, we tend to flip-flop in our policies, whether it's tax regimes or whether it is certain duty structures and so on and so forth. Uh, I think if you look at the budget last year, Give a little bit of glimpse of look. There's going to be tax consistency for five years. So in terms of uh, before COVID, um, after the president came to power, there was a reduction in the 
the, the tax regime, also the interest rates, and they said, like, look, it's going to continue for five years. The second part of it is that for these thrust sectors that we identified, uh, certain tax breaks, tax holidays was granted. This is just to create an equal level playing field with any other country has to offer in terms of the tax point of view, because I would say that's a hygiene factor. Companies do come to a country or, or a location because of all the other factors. The factor of setting up, ease of doing business, and also the profitability that you get from a location. So I think uh, DG touched upon about the, the productivity adjusted labor cost and, and the cost arbitrage that we have, which is a good thing to start with. In terms of factor cost point of view, in terms of electricity, we are one of the cheapest in the world, or in the region, I would say not world, uh, according to Jetro. But beyond that, uh, we have seen many policy changes that's come into, come into play, whether it is creating an educated talent pool uh, in terms of investing into school networks, uh, universities, the vocational training, and linking the need of the corporate uh, with the talent pool that has been, that has been created. Um, is one of the things. Um, in addition, I think BOI also plays a, a big role in terms of creating that ease of doing business and, and making it compelling for the companies to come in because being a one-stop shop in terms of providing the facilitation once they come in, set it up, whether it's a custom uh, uh, function, whether it is the approvals, whether it is attend to the day-to-day -day issues that they face, uh, that also creates that uh, ease of doing business. Like in many countries, like, like whether it's take um, Africa or whether it's take uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, the Apex Investment Facilitation Agency provides bridges that gap. Of course, Sri Lanka has a, a very ambitious goal of uh, being in the top tier by 2025 in terms of ease of doing business. And I think DG will have a session tomorrow uh, going in detail and, and honorable Nivad Cabral, uh, the minister, would also take the audience through what we are doing. But that is one aspect of it. Uh, the second part of it is building the uh, world-class infrastructure, uh, which, which we are doing. We are doing it ahead of demand, and I think DG touched on that. It's not just roads and the rail networks and the electricity grids and all that, but also building zones or locations where companies can come in and basically get the approval and set it up right away. And I think that, that again, feeds into the ease of doing business, right? So a lot of times companies will say like, oh, if you go to Dubai, you can just go and set it up. Why not in Sri Lanka? Now, two examples, like if you look at the Rawur Fabric Park, or if you look at the pharmaceutical zone being developed in Hambantota, it's pre-cleared for any type of drug you want to manufacture affluent treatment standards, uh, common facilities, everything's been set up. So the company needs to come in and basically set it up, tax-free imports of goods, all your capital items, and no hidden cost in terms of expatriating your profits. So again, that builds into the, the ease of doing business and improving our competitiveness. The talent pool, the type of talent is not just being cost-effective, cost but the right type of talent. Secondly, you also enable uh, companies to bring in the talent pools that is not here in Sri Lanka and build the talent pyramid that they require. So all these makes Sri Lanka unique in terms of in the region. And I think at the end of the day, whatever said and done, any investor want to live in or work in a place that is conducive to live, right? Um, Colombo is all, meaning I would say in the last uh, five, six, seven years, or even longer, has been rated as number one city to live in in South Asia. And, the, and, and people who have visited Sri Lanka would attest to it, right? Uh, with not just the living conditions and the, the city and all that the, the city has to offer. A uh, half an hour drive, either way, you are in a different world in terms of uh, the relaxation and, and enjoy the country. So all this, I think, packaged well, makes Sri Lanka compelling. Like we said, a little bit of paradise thrown in. Yes. Um, Mr. Manikasekra, broadly, what is the journey? Like uh, Chairman <coughs> said, uh, you know, you go to Dubai, you set it up. Why can't Sri Lanka do that here? So what is the journey an investor would need to go through when they set their minds on investing here? Thanks, Savitri, for that question. Um, actually, it's a function of where the investor is in the knowledge curve as far as Sri Lanka is concerned. Some are quite knowledgeable, knowledgeable about Sri Lanka. 
And they would naturally know that DOI is the central point of contact. Um, and if they, they can reach us through multiple channels, through the website, through our uh, email address. But for those who are not too familiar with Sri Lanka, generally they do and they can contact the Sri Lankan embassy in their own country. And all these embassies uh, has a, a commercial attache who is well versant of uh, all the, the journey that you spoke of. They will put the investor in touch. They will, first of all, educate about Sri Lanka and the investment climate. And they will um, put the investor in touch uh, at the right places um, in Sri Lanka, be it a line agency that is concerned, for example, if it's power, it's a Ceylon Electricity Board. Um, uh, if it's, if it's uh, something to do with ports, it's the Ceylon Ports Authority. But the overarching organization uh, for foreign investment is the BOI. So <clears throat> when, in, when an investor reaches out to us, a project officer will, will guide him through the, the journey first and foremost. Um, they will need to supply, uh, provide us with a uh, business pro proposal and an application. The investment officer will work with the investor to ensure that the application is complete, just like a, a visa application, right? All the mandatory fields need to be uh, filled in, check boxes ticked, etc. So once that application sees through that um, uh, process, it is taken up for screening, um, and we've regularized that. Every week, the screening committee meets. Once that project is approved, <clears throat> uh, it is, it is direct, um, the, the necessary approvals, especially from an environmental perspective, um, it depends on the type of investment and the project concern. There, are, uh, there may be certain other approvals uh, that are necessary from the local authorities or uh, power and energy, et cetera. So um, BOI will facilitate that entire process, guiding the investor. And what's good about, um, uh, the good thing that's coming, uh, working in progress, is the digitization of this entire process. We are working on, and it should come, uh, come through over the next one, one or two months, an investor can apply online, fully digitized process of application and tracking. They will be able to, uh, and it's, it's going to be a one application for most of the things that are required. You don't have to fill your company name over and over again in do dozens of applications. No, it's just one place wherever uh, we are cutting out all the um, repetitions. And Savitri, as you know, <clears throat> over the years, Sri Lanka has done, uh, made much progress along the uh, uh, rankings of ease of doing business. We being in the Amazon, but our firm target is to be in the top quartile over the next four to five years. Um, we've identified uh, very uh, important actions that are uh, necessary to streamline processes, uh, cut down the time as well as cost. Some of these quick wins should move us 15 to 20 notches over, the very, uh, over this year or the next because the, there was a cutoff in the rankings on May 1st. So some of them should get reflected in 2021 itself, but um, at most 2022 should see us move 15, 15 to 20, if not 30 notches up. Um, and as, as uh, Sanjay mentioned, quite a few things have been done in terms of easing this process of starting, uh, setting up shop. So just taking off from there, um, no investor wants to go from pillar to post, post to pillar. So some of that is being addressed. Is there, what are the processes in place actually right now where everything is streamlined and, you know, an investor who comes from abroad doesn't know whom to go meet, what to do, whatever. Would the BOI be that one-stop shop that we are looking for? Absolutely. And, and um, we will definitely guide investors exactly what is necessary to start, to start uh, operations from the time his application is approved to the time he starts commercial operation, we take, we, take, uh, we, we, we sh uh, chaperone the investor through that journey, right? Um, especially with these, for example, the, the, the uh, specialist zones, 
pre-clearance is obtained for specific activities. So special approval on environmental clearance, local authority clearances, all that is unnecessary. It will be a ma simple matter of submitting an approval uh, application, which will be centrally processed. As I mentioned, we are working on a dig fully digitized uh, journey, investment journey for, for our investors, where it's one application that will be channeled to the, all the stakeholders, be it obtaining power, be it water connections, local authority clearances, environmental clearances. For example, tourism. Uh, we are working very closely with the tourism board, where it's, it's uh, one portal, you know, one one-stop shop, uh, where uh, investors who are in, investing in the leisure industry uh, is guided from A to Z, uh, from uh, coast con conservation, uh, getting approvals from coast con conservation, for especially if you're sitting, uh, sitting up a beachside resort. Uh, to environmental clearances, local authority clearances, all that is being chaperoned by either uh, the tourism board or the board of investment. So it applies to all sectors, right? And uh, the digitization process should ensure it's seamless on one hand, reduces uh, costs, and makes it transparent where exactly in the process your approvals are as well as totally cut down the um, running from pillar to post, as you put it. So, um, Mr. Mahotala, we've seen a lot of interest being generated for the port city. Um, it's been on New York Times Square, Cision Board. Indeed, it's it's, it's got, got a lot of traction. What is the role that the port city is actually going to play in this your, your investor framework? I would say pivotal role. Because what Port City offers is a premium destination, right? So if you look at Sri Lanka point of view, we talked about its manufacturing prowess. It's, we talked about its agricultural offer and all that, right? But at the end of the day, all these will have a front-end office, a trading house, um, regional accumulation. So many of those services, as the supply chains become, the, uh, you know, uh, lengthier and de-aggregated, all these need for services needs to come in, right? So take an example like people like Liang Fang in, 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 in the rise of China played a pivotal role from Hong Kong because Hong Kong provided that opportunity. Well, Port City provides that same opportunity of regional accumulation and all those things to be done instead of Dubai or instead of Singapore from the doorstep, from Sri Lanka, taking into account both like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and all of the East Africa. So we, have, we play a very pivotal role So in terms of the regional point of view. Secondly, for all the businesses, the front and the back end services play a, a good opportunity, right? So rather than having your regional offices in, uh, say, Dubai or Singapore, now you can have it at the doorstep. You can enjoy the same benefits that you would, avoid, you would get. And you can have the manufacturing functions in Sri Lanka where it provides a compelling opportunity. So it's a very symbiotic relationship. The two entities will have, I mean, the port city and, and the Sri Lanka, because there's no port city without Sri Lanka story, and there's no Sri Lanka future story without a, uh, with a, with a prime or a premium destination like port city. Because the 80 odd thousand people who work in Port City are not going to just live, breathe, and be just be there, right? So they will land in an airport in Sri Lanka, they will traverse through the highways, the rail networks, they will go on holiday uh, for, for the, in the hotels and spend in Sri Lanka in the, uh, the, the restaurants and entertainment, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of multiply effect that creates, in, especially in the service sector. So it provides that opportunity because it's in a, such a small and enclosed area. The legal frameworks, ease of doing business, creating um, some of the streamlined approvals and all that can be provided uh, without going through some of the, the structures that you have. Uh, but having said that, it doesn't mean that uh, it's, two, it's one country with two different systems of in terms of approval and ease of doing business. Just like what DG talked about, uh, we have taken many steps to increase or improve 
a strong ease of doing business to even better, to make it world class, right? So we have a cabinet subcommittee chaired by president, where the convener is the DG of BOI, to, to take policy decisions related to investments. There's the investment task force chaired by secretary to the treasury, where BOI chairman is also part of it, to resolve any complex cross-cutting uh, projects which do not have a, 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 a I would say, uh, need to change some policy or legal realms in terms of getting things going. Uh, the BOI is in the process of even further strengthening what BOI Act has to offer. Um, there are institutions being set up um, and also with the state minister being appointed to look into and fast track any challenges that you face in terms of implementing businesses on the ground once they come in. So we are looking at sh shortening further uh, the the, the ease of doing business that we have already put in place. So think about having Port City along with that sort of in, uh, investment facilitation in Sri Lanka who uh, join together that symbiotic partnership, what would be that compelling proposition? I would say Panan, and I think that is what we are showing, showcasing today. It is not at the cusp of doing things. Most of it has happened. We are in the midst of doing the changes. I think in the today afternoon session, the, the, the audience will hear the legal reforms that we are doing, uh, setting up special courts and facilities to clear out issues related to investments. So all these has that wide, the large orchestration, and Port City becomes a crown jewel in terms of getting everything uh, linked together. Um, Chairman, I'm going to take some questions from the audience now. Sure. What are you doing to attract and retain the numerous Sri Lankan professionals, entrepreneurs and academics working overseas who are eager to return home but not confident in the strength of the economy and particularly unimpressed by local salaries? Wow, good question, Savitri. So I think I would say that question has two answers. One is that either you can, as as professionals who are listening to this, either you can wait till everything is set and a red carpet is laid and come and be part of it, or you could actually come in and help make the change. And I think I say this to private sector as well, and I see that's one of the reasons that BOI has a different look in terms of people from private sector like us coming in, me leaving my career in Singapore in a, as a partner and a managing director in a large uh, tier one consulting firm. Because we need to come join hands to build and bring that public-private sector engagement to build the country we want to build. Once we do that, I think once we, if we create the opportunities, the people will return. Right? The important thing is creating that opportunity, creating that enabling ecosystem for private sector to flourish. And it doesn't mean that the government has to do everything, but we have to make sure that the right ecosystem is done. The seeds are planted properly nourished, and we need to just be out of the hair, if you, as you say, right? So I think if you do that, with that co compelling, uh, the, 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 the compelling investor climate, I think the opportunities will come. Yes, there will be teething problems. Uh, some of the, the salaries may not be the same that what you're getting in Singapore or Dubai. But combined with the quality of living, being close to your parents, relatives, siblings, and the cost of living, it, and the opportunities to invest into a growing country. When GDP is doubling, you create so much opportunities, which you may, as an individual, may not see being outside. So I think there's much more to gain coming now and being part of that journey versus joining midstream, I would say. If I may add to that, yeah. we've seen that actually happening, both in 2004 as well as 2009. In 2004, there was a temporary ceasefire. Even in that period, we had a lot of reverse inflation. You know, I mean, uh, coming back, returnees, those who went for higher studies, those who are already had good jobs abroad, coming back, both in 2004 and 2009, those, uh, and once the war, war, ended, war ended in 2000, um, we saw a lot of uh, returnees, both in 2009 and thereafter. So. As long as the fundamentals, and even in the pandemic era, we saw quite a lot of reverse migration. Because it's nothing like home, for one. We have world-class health facilities. It provides uh, 
livable destination, both from a business point of view as well as lifestyle, right? So it's not just for um, those who are abroad, those Sri Lankans who are abroad, but it's an attractive destination for investors, not just a place to do business, but to lead, uh, lead a comfortable lifestyle. So when a company comes in, yet another question, and has to depend on imports for some of its products, like happens right now, um, are there any reductions being worked out on the high import duties that are currently in place? Uh, if you're a BOI company, there's no import duties for any raw materials that you want to export, period. So anything you bring for imports, for exports, are duty-free. So that's one of the advantages that, you, that we provide, because all, the, all these companies who are going to produce and export, they're going to compete in the world market. So they are not going to be deterred by the, the taxes or, uh, that we are going to put down. So BOI companies do not have uh, that, question, that problem. Uh, and also, if I may add, the setup cost. Uh, the, there is no duty charge on the setup costs. Right? Capital equipment. Capital equipment. Yeah. Right. As well as repatriation, unlike many competing economies, repatriation is not uh, constrained, restricted. Does Sri Lanka have commercial arbitration panels and processes to address commercial disputes if they arise? Well, that's one of the key things that we are trying, a capability that we are trying to build uh, in the port city. Um, Part of the port city is a financial hub, and along with the financial hub, the legal framework is an enabler. And to build that, uh, we already have world-class uh, councils who, who, are, who, who have a very extensive experience in uh, litigation as well as international um, arbitration, both working as councillors as well as uh, councils as well as uh, arbitrators. So that capability is there. The mechanism of, of uh, commercial arbitration, international commercial arbitration, is a capability that is being built within the port city. And the legal frame, framework should be conducive, conducive to uh, get that off the ground, where we will position ourselves, ourselves as a destination for international arbitration on par with London, Singapore, to name a few. Going back to your digitization uh, yes. the conversation we were having, <clears throat> would non-notarial supplementary agreements with the BOI be allowed to be signed electronically as facilitated by the Electronics Transaction Act? Physically signing these agreements negatively affects ease of doing business. ETA already allows this. Yes, um, Sri Lanka has gone, uh, has uh, made much progress in um, recognizing digital uh, evidence, uh, uh, giving uh, recognition to di digital evidence. So as you mentioned, we have the Electronic Transactions Act, Computer Evidence Act, and um, amendments are being brought in um, by, through the Ministry of Justice headed by Mr. Ali Sabri to facilitate the implementation. Uh, for example, if one is to uh, sign a power of attorney abroad, they can do it at, at our embassies. Um, so similarly, a mechanism will be worked out to enable the digital execution of these, uh, uh, these agreements, whether uh, one, one specific aspect uh, is for us to focus on notarial executions. Yes, agreements need to be um, uh, uh, notarial executions, and we will put in a mechanism, uh, especially through our embassies, so that um, investors can uh, even, um, we can even uh, accommodate execution of these uh, investment agreements through our embassies. It is not in place to be, to answer your uh, point straight, straight up, it is not in place right now, but it's something that it, we are uh, actively looking into. Um, Sumotala, stakeholders are demanding much more than simply a product or service to be given to them. They now want to know where it came from, how it came from, who was involved, the source, everything. So um, from a social and environmental sort of compliance perspective, how does Sri Lanka stack up in these stakes? Good question, Savitri. I think uh, I would say Sri Lanka stacks up very strongly. 
and uh, we are in the process of making those foundations even stronger. Uh, because if you look at like one of the first green factories for um, apparel sourcing is in Sri Lanka. For the longest time, we are the most ethical sourcing destination in terms of labor practices um, in the world. And I think uh, many would have seen certain uh, imagery about factory collapses and whatnot. And if you go into certain factories that we have, case in point being like Thuruli, in, uh, it's a paradise. Right? You have the gardens inside, so much greenery, so much workspace for individuals, the canteen facilities, whether it is the, uh, the living conditions, the, the, the hourly rate, the rate at what you work. So there's a lot of these positives, and that's why a lot of these brands, and you're right, they are very conscious about where you are sourcing from and from whom you are sourcing from, and how is the entire supply chain managed. So supply chain visibility also is needed. How you treat the labor is also important. Then the, the last part of it is, is that the environmental conscious part of it. So if you look at US, Europe, and many countries have put certain thresholds uh, in terms of how much energy or, or product usage has to be either organic or, or renewables, right? So if you look at as a country, the, and this actually came in much later uh, compared to what the manifesto outlined by the president uh, in 2019. Uh, now, in 2019, our outline was 70% of our energy going to be renewable-based. Huh? And last year, if I remember right, I think European Union said, um, if I remember correctly, 20% of um, uh, energy or whichever it is has to be from renewable sources. So I guess, in a way, Sri Lanka is a little bit ahead of the curve. Huh? And then I think if you look at the Eraur fabric zone we are building, the whole idea is to make sure it is environmentally conscious in terms of sourcing, whether it's the water usage, whether it's the power usage, whether it's the carbon footprint. Uh, because if you do that, like you don't have to bring in fabrics in the last moment on airlifted, not that it, it cannot be completely eliminated, but can be reduced. So overall, if you bring in the environmental sensitive part of it, we have two, two feathers in our hat being the most ethical source in destination and the most environmental source in destination, I couldn't think, I can't think of many countries who could claim such. So that is just in terms of uh, apparel, but the same will be for others, right? If you run a data center in Sri Lanka, it's, in, it's the same. You are, you'll be using renewable energy whereby reducing the carbon footprint reducing the, the demands put by, whether it's a Google or Amazon or a, uh, Apple or a Microsoft, in terms of an, uh, in, in what you call renewable energy usage uh, in, in, their, in their systems and platforms. So we have taken those steps, and we are now going to probably see the benefits coming in with these companies looking around and seeing that, well, actually, Sri Lanka does offer what we are looking for and align along with in very much aligned with their corporate philosophy or the policies. So it's all about being ahead of the curve and thinking ahead and building and putting the foundation for enabling these companies to come in. So when they come into Port City, all these are already provided for. Uh, Mr. Manikasekar, two questions. I think you can sort of uh, put it both together in one answer. Do you have a policy document for foreign institutional investors who want to set up shop in Sri Lanka? And can that document be shared? What are the measures taken to increase the involvement of Sri Lankan embassies in foreign countries in terms of attracting FDIs? And because currently that contribution is not visible. Very timely question, I would say. <clears throat> Let me answer the second um, first. So you will see quite a lot of country sessions in this uh, Sri Lanka Investment Forum. Um, quite a lot of uh, focused on those markets. And those are driven by those embassies themselves, right? So there is a very active uh, contribution to the FDI attraction process uh, by, the, by our embassies. They, uh, the, our ambassadors are very active and contribute significantly. They are our arms and limbs on the ground in our markets. Uh, they, are, they champion our cause. They, they do their own uh, the, the, take the Sri Lanka story 
within those respective countries. Um, going back to the, uh, the, uh, the first question, as, as I mentioned, uh, Port City is going to be a hub for financial services, for international financial services, right? And we, this, I take this opportunity to invite the global financial powerhouses to look at Sri Lanka as they are setting up their regional HQs. Why? If you, for a moment, if you uh, focus on the east of the Atlantic, and if you look at that globe, we are right at the epicenter, right? And that's, that's the value of our strategic location. It's at the epicenter of the rest of the world, if you park Americas for the time being. And within one or two hours flight time, you have access to two billion people. Four hours timeline, four billion people, right? Covering the next growth centers will be um, East Coast Africa and South, uh, South uh, Asia, right? So Sri Lanka is strategically positioned in the um, uh, Silk Road, the old Silk Road, uh, as uh, you know. It's a maritime hub. It's a logistics hub. It's an aviation hub, and all these will trickle into be making it a financial hub, right? There is a, spe uh, why, uh, there's a special commission, the Colombo Port City Commission, with wide-ranging powers. And mind you, um, I've, I've, I've spoken, uh, I'll, I'll be speaking about this in uh, a separate session on tomorrow. ease of doing business tomorrow, and I invite you to um, participate and uh, get more information on the ease of doing business. With all the wide-ranging powers the Economic Commission has, it should be on top, a par with the top financial hubs of the world, the, the DIFCs, the D Dubai, the uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, etc. And then its notional ranking in the ease of doing business should be in the top 25, uh, 25 to 30. Um, and, and Sri Lanka as a whole is, uh, is uh, working on digitizing and making all these processes um, much more streamlined, transparent, easy, less cost. But over and above, the port city should provide um, even uh, m much more investor friendly, uh, especially for financial services, right? There'll be, um, it's not just, it's not just um, office space that is being offered. It's a holistic ecosystem that is being provided, including uh, living uh, spaces uh, for, uh, for all the expats who are likely to come down. There's a marina, there's going to be um, international hotel chains coming in, hospitality, uh, and even healthcare facilities and ed education facilities. So that it's a holistic ecosystem to build a world-class financial hub. Final question, Mahatala, very quickly. Sri Lanka is not alone in this fight for getting investors, right? Because this whole region is looking for that. So if you were to give Sri Lanka's comparative strengths for an investor to choose Sri Lanka over another destination in Asia, what would they be? You're right. We are not alone in this game. Uh, there are many newcomers who will probably try to run a little bit faster than we have been. But I think one thing that Sri Lanka offers is, is resilience. Um, and I think the opportunity. We've been an open economy far greater, far longer than any others in this region. We've been the first country to embrace open economy back in 1978. Today we have close to about 1,200 foreign companies um, who have been here for generations. Uh, companies who really see investing in Sri Lanka still quite, is quite compelling. Like example being uh, $1.5 billion worth of capital formation that happened last year, 50% came in companies expanding their existing footprint to take advantage of all the geopolitical shifts and everything. So we have a good ecosystem ripe. Secondly, we are looking at a policy orchestration in a country at a cusp of doubling its GDP. We have come to $4,000 per GDP, almost like doubling since the war, or even more, two and a half times, I would say. We are looking at growing that at the jerk curve. 
We have outlined in terms of the policies, the industries, the sector orchestration, interrelated sector growth, linkages, port city, so and so forth. So just that, that's a country story. But what gives it a tailwind? It's like what happened to Hong Kong when China boomed, right? So you have India, which is going to grow through the next growth decade. You have Bangladesh is growing at rapidly. You look at Pakistan, you look at East Africa. So here's an epicenter who can trade with every, all of these countries. So we have a little bit of tailwinds. We have a educated talent pool, 100% literacy, almost at youth level, 50% uh, mobile or technology literacy, 30% computer literacy, which you can't see much in many other countries. So if you combine those things, and of course, thrown in a really great place to live in, <laughs> I wonder, why not Sri Lanka? So I think uh, we are here to make the investor's journey uh, much more easier and uh, hassle-free. So I would um, encourage investors who are listening in to consider Sri Lanka as your next investment opportunity and take advantage of what Sri Lanka has to offer. So that's my appeal to all of you. Would you have anything to add, Mr. Vanakasek? Well, let me wrap up by saying, I Bhuvan, wanna come? Welcome to Asia's next, next growth haven. Thank you. So there's nothing uh, called long-term plans anymore. I think the pandemic has taught us that being flex flexible and able to transform very rapidly is the trick to staying in business. Sri Lanka has put on that cap of readiness. And in fact, we are ready for change. Being flexible, fluid, and constantly reinventing uh, so that we can actually move towards uh, the change of changing stakeholder demands. Uh, like Chairman said, uh, like Mr. Mahotala said, we are an economy that has been an open economy far longer than the other, uh, most of the other countries here in Asia. We also have shown remarkable resilience over various challenges that the country has faced and the region has faced. So we also have a strong IT foundation which aids that quick transformation ability. We have a constant upskilling of HR with globally needed competencies. Uh, don't forget that literacy of almost 100% among youth, as he was saying, a strong network across borders to key markets and countries, and a strong emphasis on global competencies and best practices when it comes to social and environmental best practices. So finally, Investment facilitation processes and systems that add to the holistic investor destination persona. Thank you very much for joining us today. And are you Bowen? Hi, Bowen. Okay, no timing. Perfect. Yeah.